a new paradigm of exploration. It makes a pinpoint landing. Made possible by industry and innovation. Yes! <laughs> That's unreal. Allowing humans to travel into space for business and pleasure. I was once a child with a dream. Taking them to new worlds of unprecedented potential. The moon will lead the way to Mars and we should be there within the next couple of decades. And we're starting right where we began. For several years, she has fascinated many. No way! We landed on the moon! We just got word from Houston. Let's go for launch. Six, five, four, three, two. I must stress these are not the scale. After nearly 50 years, astronauts are getting ready to go back to the moon. But why now? A lot has changed since NASA's six successful Apollo missions, which landed 12 men on the lunar surface over the course of just three years. We tend to remember the first. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But the last flight, Apollo 17, not so much. America has found some fair winds and following seas and we're on our way home. With many Americans satisfied the space race with the Soviet Union had been won, a quieter era of space exploration followed. When humanity was last there, it was a geopolitical battle, right? It was who's going to make it first. Primarily, it was a battle of wills and supremacy. So it didn't matter what the cost was, you know, it, it didn't matter, we just had to do it. Bearing the Soviet coat of arms and hammer and sickle pennants, it traveled 35 hours through space. But today that's different. So people are looking for, what we're looking for is a more sustainable access. And it, not like catching a bus and going down the street, but basically it's an aim to have this as a, a destination for us to go to routinely uh, cheaply, um, an extension of our home here on Earth. So the race back to the moon is on, but this time it's just a stepping stone to the universe beyond. NASA's Artemis program appears to be the front runner. Artemis is aiming to land a crew, including the first woman and the first person of colour, on the lunar surface by 2024. Next, it'll establish the first long-term human presence on the moon with a permanent orbiting lunar base, which they've named Gateway. And from that gateway, the next giant leap for mankind, sending humans to Mars and beyond. To achieve these ambitious mission objectives, the US Space Agency is working with its commercial and international partners, including Australia. It's very exciting that you know NASA has announced its plan to return to the moon and, and eventually to Mars and it's often asked you know why is that why are we going back to the moon this is about really humanity for the first time sort of permanently establishing bases and and a presence on celestial bodies like like the moon and one of the reasons to do this is you just look at the incredible benefits the discoveries that came out of the Apollo missions Looking real fine. It's led to inspire a generation of people to pursue careers in space, many of the astronauts, many of the, the founders of, of some of the most successful commercial space businesses were, were inspired uh, by the Apollo missions. And so, you know, I think it's in our DNA uh, to explore and return to the moon and, and eventually Mars and beyond is something we should do as a species. The idea is that for deeper space exploration, we'll need to harness the resources the moon has to offer, replenishing essential supplies like rocket fuel, oxygen and water. I know it seems a long way away when we look at it in the sky, and it is. You wouldn't want to walk there, but um, it's really close. Okay, so it's our closest neighbour. Um, it's full of wonderful um, 
uh, useful substances that we can build from, right? So it has uh, something called helium-3, which is very rare here on Earth. There's copious amounts of that on the moon. You can use it for power. You can use it for a whole bunch of things. Um, it has water there as well we can extract from. It has materials we can use. So it's so much easier launching from the moon to go elsewhere in the solar system like Mars than it is doing it straight from Earth. I know that sounds like a long way away, but it, trust me, it's not that far. While this might all sound a bit far-fetched, companies like SpaceX are making some real advances. Release and lift off. We wouldn't have these opportunities of having these conversations if it wasn't for, in large part, SpaceX lowering the cost of access to space and low Earth orbit. It's changed everything. And no one thought that was possible. Commercial entities have the capabilities that was once the preserve of the world's major superpowers, the ability to put humans into space, the ability to launch and operate sophisticated satellites. And we're going to see that commercialization, which is you know, very prominent now in low Earth orbit, eventually extend to the moon. This new space race driving ambition, innovation and achievement is to be commercial, with nation states scrambling to keep pace. Russia and China are teaming up to build a lunar base of their own. That's slated for 2036. It's kind of like the first railroads, I suppose, isn't it? The first groups of people who figured out the technology and made it were the ones that reaped the benefits at the end. And I think it's a little bit like that because it's the ultimate infrastructure project. The global space economy, all the science, innovation and infrastructure it involves, is forecast to grow exponentially from nearly half a trillion dollars today to anywhere between one and a half and three point seven trillion dollars by 2040. And Australia's share of that looks promising, especially as a space communications hub, a legacy already endowed by our role in tracking Apollo 11's space flight and helping broadcast images of the first moonwalk to the world. Geographically, uh, we have a unique view of, of really a, a hemisphere of Earth, um, an un unobstructed view, but also a view out to space. And, and that's been recognised for 60 years of collaboration with NASA through the Deep Space Network. We talk to some of the probes that are the furthest human-made objects that are now exploring the outer reaches of the solar system and beyond. And so we've demonstrated the capability to do that. Um, and we have a lot of infrastructure already uh, on the ground uh, that can support that. Australians don't understand what they have is actually really cutting edge when it comes to considering new space. Resource extraction, artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles. Australia is a massive country, communications, it's huge. I mean, it's, it, there are very few countries on the planet that can compete with, us, with Australian geography and just literally the size of the country and its experience and heritage with communications. It's cloud, low cloud cover is excellent for optical communications. So when I say it can be the hub of the solar system communications in the future, I'm not, I'm not making that up. I, I genuinely feel it's better placed today than any other country on the planet. The Australian Space Agency has launched its Moon to Mars initiative as a result of its partnership with NASA. The goal here is to foster Australian space innovation, which could play a key role in getting back to the moon and venturing on to Mars. With the government's joint effort on the Artemis program, there's a really good chance we'll have some of our technology on the surface of the moon by the end of the decade, and there'll be an Australian flag. Gilmore Space Technologies, based in Queensland, is aiming to contribute to Artemis and this new era. The company has managed to secure the largest private investment ever by an Australian space startup. With Gilmore Space being now um, one of the leaders in Australia, I think what excites me is the fact that we will actually be launching a rocket from Australia. So this will be the first Australian made rocket that will be launched to all the next year. Basically from 2023, late 2023 onwards, we'll have payload capacity to at least take small satellites to the moon orbit. We're interested in the moon um, very much because it's a lot easier to, to get to the moon, to stay on the moon, to live on the moon, and more importantly, to have commercial activities on the moon compared to Mars. If you think about travel distance, it's three days to the moon, it's six months to Mars. You know, I like to make a bet that there'll be 100,000 people living on the moon before there's 1,000 people living on Mars. 
we visited every planet in the solar system multiple times in many cases and sent back some amazing images. We've mapped and viewed our planet from space so many times, so many different wavelengths and for so many reasons, you know. And so we've come such a long way since that first satellite launch in the 50s. But we are at a turning point. I, I, I mean, I'm in the industry and I have to say it, it feels different. It feels this turning point in terms of accessibility and making it pardon the pun, more down to earth. I mean, just the, it's just tangible that you can reach out and, and be doing things in space now. And it's part of a, a business plan for a startup, you know? Uh, I mean, imagine that. There seem to be boundless opportunities, but a real concern is who will control the new resources? Attempts for some legal framework are rooted in the Outer Space Treaty of 1969, which laid out some basic principles for human space exploration. That it should be peaceful and benefit all of humanity, as opposed to just one country. But it's a bit short on detail. The Moon Agreement of 1979 tried to prevent commercial exploitation of resources in space. Only a few states have signed it though. So who's missing? the largest three space-going nations, respectively the US, China and Russia. Over the last year, 12 nations have signed the Artemis Accords, recognising their mutual interest in the exploration of space for peaceful purposes. But Russia and China are notably absent. The race back to the moon between nation-states, a constellation of alliances and commercial entities, is forcing the issue when we reach a new frontier, how will we divvy up the valuable resources? I don't think it's inevitable that humanity does uh, colonise the solar system and beyond. And I think the steps that we're making in the next 20 to 50 years will be the real um, you know, epicentre of that activity. We are definitely at a, a turning point and an inflection point for the Australian space sector. The momentum is building. I think right now is really the brimming point where the space industry is really starting to, to roll. I think the moon is a really good proving ground for really exploring the solar system. It came in peace for all mankind. Arthur C. Clarke said in one of his books, humans stepping foot on the moon is what will be remembered in the future more than anything else. The date, the time where we first were able to set foot on another body. July 1969. I think it's right and I think it's incredibly sort of impactful and frames how important this journey is and how it will be remembered in the future. And the next time we set foot on the moon, the plan is to stay.